it's not a job that scales. Like business class is a pre-recorded online course it's called business class because it's aviation themed and I'm dressed like a flight. Yeah, yeah. Went to raise it. Well, and I realized I had great deal flow. Founders would get on the phone with me. I could get into deals that were closed. I've done that several times. Invested in Liquid Death at 50 posts. They're at 700 million now. Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. Hi, Sophia. Welcome to Smart Venture Podcast today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm sorry. Before we hop on this call, I literally like said so many things to Sophia. Like I'm like, you are the literally like my dream guest to have. And then I feel like you are just absolutely killing it in everything that you have done so far. And I wanted to go back a little bit on like, you know, you talk about this, your family dynamic on like Stephen Bartlett's show. And like you were this person who were like stealing from the grocery store to starting this multi-million, multi-hundreds millions of dollar company. And I feel like, and then now you're like running your own fund. I want to know like who, what is like one moment that in your life that's early on that shaped into who you are today? I mean, I think. Yeah, when my I got my first job at Subway when I was like 15, I think I was a sandwich artist. Mm -hmm. sandwich and I remember my dad told me to go in and ask for the manager with my resume, which had nothing on it. I guess it was a job application. And if they weren't there to come back and like ask when the manager will be there and then go in when the manager was there and introduce myself. And then once I got the job, he, my dad told me like, even when there's nothing to do when the floor is clean, sweep the floor, like don't stand around basically. And I think that work ethic really stuck with me, but there's a definitely like a gap in like the work ethic period that you just <laughs> referred to, which was me trying to do as little as possible because I didn't, I wasn't cut out to do a nine to five, but also I didn't even understand what a career was. That's mm -hmm. one thing I can't attribute entrepreneurship to. My parents very much worked, but the whole idea of moving up in a career or, you know, I didn't go to college, you know, so that was all accidental. And I think the work ethic was something that my dad instilled in me very early on. What do you think is like your dream career? I feel like, and then who is on your personal board of advisors when it comes to part women? Since like, you know, obviously your dad plays a really important role as telling about the work ethic, but you figure out so many things on your own. Like oh you God. pilot so many things and you're like such a creative just by like, you know, trust bump the name and then like nasty girl the name. I know that you talk about this in like Jason Calcana's podcast. I feel like you are one of the most creative person when it comes to branding. I wonder like how does these ideas, where do they come from? It's a good question. I mean, in terms of my personal board of advisors, there are people, I mean, I can just look at my texts because I text them all day. And okay. My personal board of advisors, I talk to Rob Hayes a lot from first mm -hmm. round. So he's one of my LPs. He's always been super duper helpful. Shameen at BAM is really helpful to me. I'm like literally just looking at my tech. There's just so many people that I, you know, text Nicole Wishoff. You know, she's mm -hmm. like a few years ahead of me in terms of her fund, also an emerging manager but has been really generous in giving, giving me kind of a view of the landscape as, you know, someone who just raised my first fund. Let's see. I mean, the list, the list goes on. I would say I chat with Rob Hayes more than anyone. Heaton Shaw is another person I talk to a lot. Ryan Hoover is someone I talk to a lot. It's like a long list. So that's one thing about entrepreneurship or even starting a fund or building anything from the ground up especially when you haven't worked at a firm or you haven't built a company before. There are so many blind spots. It doesn't matter, you know, how much education you have. The people around you are the kind of the web. They are the mesh that fills in your blind spots. And all you have to do is ask questions and people are generally really generous and excited to help out. In terms of branding, like where did I get this branding acumen? It's a good question. I think I've always been, had an irreverent perspective which is such a I don't know that what about that word it's like saying edgy it's not that like interesting mm -hmm. or descriptive but I think I've always had a little bit of like an outsider's view or oblique point of view that gives me an advantage 
when it comes to, or even naivete, it gives me an advantage when it comes to creating a brand that cuts through the noise because I don't, you know, trust fund is like, you know, could be polarizing. Nasty Gal certainly was. And I had to buy the URL from a porn, like a squatter <laughs> troll. I don't know what you call them, but they, they cut through the noise. So it's like I, the name of the fund alone, people are like, oh shit, like that's the best name ever. Guys didn't do that with Girl Boss, but like with trust fund, it's really gratifying to go to the upfront summit and I'll be like, yeah, I do this thing. And they're like, God damn it. Why didn't I think of that name? It's so good. Huh? So it's just, it's fun. Like it's everything I do is, you know, this is trust funds and play on words, girl boss. I don't know. I just put two words together and they attached and it became this whole, they other thing. <laughs> but it was, you know, the reference for, for girl boss was this like 19- a Japanese movie or something. Yeah. Like Japanese female revenge film, which is like super funny and stylish and kind of bad, but one of Tarantino's inspirations references. And then, you know, nasty gals, an album by swimming Betty Davis was married to Miles Davis, this amazing funk singer. So it's also just like cultural references because Mm -hmm. I cared more about music probably than anything before I accidentally started a business. So I've always infused, I guess, that the personality or the culture, the things that I really appreciate into what I do and the voice of what I do. I wonder like if you're starting out today, if you're like, if Trust Fund is your first project, Ever, what would you do to make it like huge? Like, let's say if Sophia Amoroso was not a super like iconic person who started this you're like so amazing nice. brand. You're, you're no, so I'm good. not joking. I you're absolutely killing it, and then you're like unfailable at this point in your life. Like you could just do anything, and then people would just just like throw money or something, and no. and then you're like uncancelable, like literally right now. What are you point, talking like, about? I've already been canceled. Like, no, like I mean, you are uncancelable. Like. It's, Like, I feel like you've done so many, like, amazing entities in your life. You created this, like, you know, most people just gave up at one point of their career. Like, I feel like they just, like, call it a day or something. But you're, like, constantly still, like, hustling. You're having a new venture every few years. Last time I saw you have, like, business class. And then now you're, like, you have trust bond. And I've been just, like, following your, like, stalking your. Oh, yeah. Business class. Talk about that brand. That's another fun play on words. I have an online course called Business Class. So business class is probably making a lot of money as like it's probably not because when people think about like starting a fund, people think, oh, oh, my God, like now I have like 10 million. They just think, oh, this person have 10 million dollars to spend now. But it's oh, my God, like imagine all the fee that you have to pay, like the back office, blah, 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 and like all the operational costs. But you have to actually make a business on the side to actually spend the money on your own or like just having a lifestyle that's like, you know, survive or something. So Hunter, what's your like personal like journey like to building up this empire or like this different basket of business? And what's your end goal? And I just have so many questions. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, right now the dream job would be doing what I'm doing with trust fund and business class, but trust fund is really my focus. It's like, it's not a job that scales like business class is a pre-recorded online course called business class. Cause it's aviation themed and I'm dressed like a flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In each of the, I saw that I saw, I I'm like, Oh my God, you are such a genius with, not Oh, like, and you're like, so good with like, everything. endlessly, you, do, you yeah. know, funny and funny and copywriting. And I'm not, you know, my mom's a writer. So I think I might've gotten some of that from her, but business class was something I started during COVID. I had left my second company, Girl Boss, after I sold at the end of 2019. The business was events and brand partnerships. When COVID hit, brands pulled all their dollars. We couldn't do events. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to move on. The company had sold. And so I'd seen all these online course creators and this like formula. I was like, you know what? I never want to invent a business model again. Like I'm great at brand. I'm great at starting things. I tend to like, you know, build things that people rally around and identify with and think are funny. And I don't take myself too seriously and hopefully also offer value at the same time and realized I had a lot to share. You know, I went from dressing people and that inspiring them like (laughs) motorcycle jacket being like as inspiring as eventually the book became. And that motorcycle jacket, when a girl bought a motorcycle jacket at nasty gal, she was like, Oh my God, like I can take on the world. Like you're, (laughs) you know, before we started recording, you're talking about like nasty gal clothes and (laughs) it's like, it's this, it's not clothes, you know, girl boss was like this. It wasn't a book. It was like Mm -hmm. so much more like, wow, I can see myself in this, in this future. That's just a few steps ahead of me. And with, you know, business class to me, while it's an online course for entrepreneurs, it's like, it's the same thing. It's like seeing yourself in this future. That's not that too far ahead of you. 
And the person leading it, me, is someone that like you can relate to because I don't have like the pedigree that a lot of the people who are out there dispensing advice have, which is like not that relatable. So what I realized is like, okay, I've inspired people, but now I want to like give them knowledge. So I've accumulated all of this knowledge and all of these relationships and learned from my own mistakes, but also hired really great leaders and watched people do it well and also know what good looks like even in the places that I didn't do a good job. And it feels, it's incredibly gratifying to pass along what it is that I've learned. Over the course of my career, I've extracted enough value and whatever, I'll be 40 in April. I'm not sure like if it's an age thing or an I'm exhausted by building businesses thing, but harvesting all of my experience for a new generation of entrepreneurs is so wildly fulfilling. And I've done that through business class, which is, you know, it's a digital product. It's relatively on autopilot. Yeah, it's done like 5 million profitably since I started it. It's not, I'm not building a big organization. I have one person full-time on business class. And it's like, it doesn't really require much of my time. Trust fund is like, I'm not even trading my time for money because the management fees are so small. So I can't even say, but there's nothing that scales. The only thing that scales with a venture fund, it takes 10 years for, for there to be any kind of efficiencies, right? The money is the efficiency, but it's not your time spent It's not your time with LPs. It's not your, you know, it's like, that is, there's no efficiencies. You're having coffee, you're having dinner, you're talking to founders, you're on the phone, you're looking at decks, you're writing a deal memo, having coffees with other GPs and investors. So there's absolutely no wait for that to become more efficient than it is beyond creating some systems and a great CRM and, you know, hiring a team. So it's having a fund is a very different job. And I have a $5 million fund. The management fees are small. I've written 12 checks out of the fund. And, you know, ultimately in terms of like this phase, it's just, I guess like the theme is I just want to work with founders. I like being in the weeds. I'm not someone that should be tasked with growing like a massive organization. I like being close to founders. I like looking at all of these amazing companies that are being founded. And I just love learning. I'm just kind of, you know, I don't want to hire a huge executive team and have them tell me like, that's my job. Like, I want to go do the things that eventually when you have 50 people, you have to delegate. And I just don't like doing that. I'm kind of useless once and not even redundant useless, just actually useless as a leader. (laughs) Cause Mm -hmm. I don't, it's not 50 people is not in my future. How, I guess like when you are thinking about starting your venture fund, like, what do you think is the value at because I saw that you invest in you know a lot of consumer facing things for example for like MoonPay and Public I feel like or Superhuman I feel like they're all like consumer facing SaaS mm-hmm. product and I wonder like what's your thought on the edge or like liquid death like obviously it's like a consumer product and I wonder what's your thought on like your edge when you became an investor and when you're talking about like renting funds like a five million dollar fund it's still gonna take whatever to like ex- to like fundraise and now like I guess like when you're investing on your own you could just be like oh whatever if I lose like this like 50k or something it's my own money you don't have to be responsible but like when let's say your friends invest in your company how do you deal with the fact that like they're losing their money or something like I, I guess maybe I'm just like so negative when it comes to thinking that way but like a lot of people say you should never think that way But I wonder, like, what's your thought process on that? And then you obviously have a lot to offer to the entrepreneurs from branding to experiences to like operating like mindsets and everything. But I wonder, how do you translate that into helping SaaS companies when they are? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So as an angel, I invested in over 20 companies too much. You have really good portfolio. Thank you. Yeah. So I didn't intend for it to be fund zero. I was stage agnostic and sector agnostic and invest in things I liked. And, you know, some of them were later invested in liquid death at 50 posts. They're at 700 million now invested at in this passport, which is this international shipping, like logistics software layer, passportshipping.com. I invested in that like super early and that's like a 47 X return. I've sold secondary in two of those companies, which is awesome because I have great relationships with the founders and some of it was consumer. Some of it was B2B. Passport is very B2B. I think Superhuman is increasingly B2B. I don't think people who aren't at their desk are using it just to email their mom or whatever. Like I do see it as a B2B product, but I I didn't have a thesis as an angel. I was like, I understand this. I know why people are using it. Or I just think this is a great opportunity. 
when I went to raise it, well, and I realized I had great deal flow. Founders would get on the phone with me. I could get into deals that were closed. I've done that several times as an angel. And now I'll just read Axios and go shopping and be like, oh, this deal is closed. Not for me. Like I'll just (laughs) write whoever at the firm, like led the deal and be like, Hey, is it really? Cause I have a really friendly collaborative check, you know, 200 K it's not gonna really change the game for anybody. Like, can I talk to the founder? And I've done that. I don't know what, maybe four times now where a deal's closed and I just like go inbound and I'm like, really? So I have, you know, and also I can negotiate advisory shares on top of it, which as an angel was great, but with, for the fund is awesome because I roll them into the fund effectively, you know, lowering the valuation, you know, the entry price at the time of my investment. So realized I love doing it. Like I said, I love working with founders. I love learning and was sitting on this like kind of crazy stack of advantage as a a fund manager, as I was considering doing it. And so the the full stack, I guess, and when it comes to like B2B SaaS, right? I was like, okay, I need a thesis. I want to focus. Great. I invested in, you know, liquid death. They did great. I built a consumer business, but I understand the psychology of the person choosing Shopify over Squarespace, which are B2B products, right? And they're choosing Shopify or Squarespace over Shopify or whatever because of the brand, because they are consumers, right? Mm -hmm. I started my first business on eBay. There weren't other choices. There was no Etsy, whatever. It was late 2006, but I was a consumer of that. And I built a really big business off the back of that. And then I was like authorized.net. And then I was, I don't even know if ever used Stripe, honestly, like at Nasty Gal, it was so early and the power of those tools to change someone's life. And for example, I, you know, through the fund, I invested in a dental labor marketplace called Toothio. So Kraft led their seed round earlier last year. And, you know, women, mostly women, dental hygienists can now, because of this piece of software, go work on their own schedule and book shifts at dentist offices in a way they've never been able to literally just in that toothio that piece of software is doing for them what ebay did for me and i understand the aspiration of the 99 percent of people that are starting businesses you know smbs freelancers creators solopreneurs side hustlers and then also you know venture back founders and how this software can be such a huge unlock and the aspiration of that product both from the the product itself and the way it's designed and the way it guides you through understanding like, okay, this is what employing somebody looks like in gusto. I would not have known how to hire somebody or what, you know, what I need to file at the end of the year, but guess what? I pushed some buttons and this thing's prompting me to do this. And now I'm an employer that's totally compliant. That's nuts. I can push a button and run payroll. Like I don't have to like email EDP, I ADP. I didn't even know what ADP is. Like most people starting businesses don't. So the product creating the inputs for a user to, that the inputs are, I don't know what you, you mean, the fields, right? Whatever the product demystifies what the founder needs to know just by existing and onboarding them. That's a really powerful thing. So I see these products as consumer products because the person choosing, like I said, Shopify or Squarespace or Gusto over JustWorks, they're not putting out an RFP for, mm-hmm. they, they don't know what SaaS is. They're considering these things. They don't call it logistics. They call it shipping. It's just mm-hmm. different. And I understand that person. And I don't want to build a consumer. I don't want to spend the second half of my career helping people build the type of business that I couldn't into a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. I don't think that fashion businesses for the most part are venture backable businesses. Um, and it's just, it's not what I want to spend my time doing. And so in terms of this, like what I'm talking about, is like, okay, I can get on the phone with founders. I have a really vast network of investors and LPs that I've known for a very long time. Like I met Jeremy Liu in 2012 and Jeff Jordan, they both flew down separately to LA and to possibly invest in nasty gal. Right. So, and they're both LPs in the fund. So it's like, it's, um, it's interesting to be established as an emerging manager, right. I'm like a known entity, but I'm like still very new at this job. And it's not the same as writing an angel check and losing my money. You're right. And then I understand the founders experience, the experience of the founder I'm investing in. So I understand their end user. I understand the experience of the founder that I can make an impact on directly by working with them. I've got amazing access. I think I have pretty good taste. I have an okay angel track record. And 
then also have this like platform, right? I've got like, and it's the runoff of having done stuff. Like I wasn't like, I'm going to build a LinkedIn audience or I'm going to build an Instagram audience. It was like, I wrote a book, made a bunch of noise, did some stuff, was on the cover of Forbes and all this crazy shit. And so I have an audience of people who read Girl Boss who are stoked on entrepreneurship. And so they don't care about fashion. It's been, you know, it's been 10 years, right? We're all older. The Girl Boss was yay. And now we've all fallen on our faces and we're like, okay, that was cute, but I need to build something that makes me money. I want to buy a house, whatever. So I have this really qualified audience as well who are interested in these types of products. And so I think one validation point of that because I could be like oh yeah they're you know they like b2b software products totally ah that's an advantage that's my wedge um but in the last year I've like I've worked with Notion and SurveyMonkey and SoFi and Dell and a bunch of b2b brands who've come to me and said like hey we want to pay you to like post about us we want to do an integration with your social stuff and like, I don't have any management fees. And this was, you know, a lot of it was before the fun. So I'm like, sure, but there's really smart marketers who are doing their own diligence on me, not as a fund manager, but as someone who can speak credibly to an audience that's qualified to hear about those types of products, which is like, well, thank you very much for validating what I think is GP thesis fit. It's not something I'm just saying. It's saying that it's something that people who, you know, are putting their jobs at risk are validating with their budgets. So yeah, I love this job and I want to build a really enduring fund. Mm -hmm. It's year and some change in since I wrote the first check. And my job now is, you know, if I'm the inventory and I'm building a platform, how do I scale that and the impact I can make and the relationships that I have? And how do I raise another fund that, you know, isn't a $5 million fund, but something that's 20 or 30 where I can actually pay myself. I think you I'm sorry. I think you can raise a bigger fund. And I wonder, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, why do you set as like, I know that you didn't set as five minutes. I think you probably set like as something smaller, but like you accidentally raised like six million over like a weekend or something. I wonder how does a fundraising journey look like for you? And then when you are like, if you're building the fund from today, I just want to say like all these branding, this is like such a branding genius, like our focus. And then like, I'm just looking at your fund page. They're, they're not even your pictures. They, I don't I really know, know the, the about us are. page. Like, the about us page. Is going funny. On, man? Like, I think you're just like such an authentic person, but like, I just like wanted to know, like, what's your roadmap nowadays like everyone and their mom is like trying to start a fund and especially with the help of like angelus and every operator of any size of startup are like oh actually i'm actually investing on the side but i wonder like how do you kind of like you said like cut through the noise and obviously branding is one big factor and then obviously you are a founder and then how do you kind of like articulate the value add to the founders? And then also like there's a rising new generation of people that are coming. Like they may not be, I'm a fan of that Nazi girl, but like I just had a seven month old son. And then like, I feel like when they are becoming the next generation of like builders or whatever, how do you kind of like create the noise to the next generation of people? Totally. I mean, honestly, I think it's fun and humor and showing people the mirror of, I want my logo in that portfolio. I want, she's picking winners and I want our logo next to that company because I think that's an awesome company and I want to know that founder and, and I know that she can help. Right. And so I think like, it's like, it's weird just to talk about yourself and be like, Oh, like, here's how I can help or whatever. So I screenshot everything that founders send me that are like, Oh my God, whatever. A couple of recently, two of baton market one of my most one of my investments through the fund were like two people heard about the job through you and I was like what did I even post about it and they're like no they like came to the website and then they checked us out mm -hmm. and you know there's some kind of mm -hmm. you know maybe it's like oh wow because Sophia invested in this it's like a great place to work and I have gotten on the phone with angel companies to close and with trust fund companies like close a candidate like this is why this is a really exciting opportunity so that's fun but I've got this whole I have two monitors couple slides in my deck and it's like Sophia your post and newsletter drove more leads to the wait list than all of our investors combined or another founder saying the founder of Baton Market that I just mentioned saw that you invested in browse AI another company tried it out today super useful officially a paying customer already good investment you know it's like that's so gratifying 
whatever. So I don't make, if I made it up, it wouldn't work. I wouldn't, there is, there's, you know, there's goodwill and word of mouth. And also with trust fund, like in terms of building a brand, it's like, you know, I have an outsider. I've always had an outsider perspective, I guess, for everything that I do. I think there's just like an opportunity to infuse like fun and humor into the venture world. And I don't want to pussyfoot into it. So I like, you know, threw a big party at LA Tech Week and I don't know what, what else. I threw a poker game for like 50 women at my house and, you know, had some awesome early stage founders and emerging fund managers. And I'm actually having something on Monday for the upfront thing. I've got like 95 people RFCP'd. And it's going to rain and I don't have that much space inside. So that's going to be interesting. But it's just like when there are opportunities, I seize them. And it's like, I haven't paid myself anything out of the management fees this year or at all, but I'm going to throw a party, but also I'm going to get some sponsors because I don't, you know, to cover it, which I have, which is awesome. Mercury tactic. Have you mm-hmm. heard of tactic? No. What is tactic? Dude, it's so, it's just so weird that people don't know about it. Like I rely on stuff like, you know, if Angelus didn't exist, I wouldn't be doing this job trying to figure it out with like pieces of paper or whatever people did 20 <laughs> years ago. Similarly, Tactic is it's fund modeling software. So instead of building an, an unwieldy spreadsheet that like breaks every time, you know, I, I'm that's not my strong suit. You know, you can create an account, you can model out different scenarios, you can model out different funds, different size funds, you can um, track the performance of all your companies, you can buy LPs to come check it out. It's like super powerful, but it's so weird. It's just really weird that no one's heard about him. Anyway, that's the, the power of software, right? That allows me to do this job. And in terms of fund managers that are tourists, I think that time, like that was a fun time. Like, the, you know, I, it wasn't fun for me. I wasn't raising a fund, but, you know, if, had I started a fund two years ago, I wouldn't have had to learn what I have. I wouldn't have had to answer the tough questions that I have. People aren't just throwing money at me, you know? Sure, like 1500, 200K ch- checks, but I'm not, ask, you know, it's, I'm not getting, I'm not raising like a fund that even has room for a $2 million, you know, institutional check. So those are going to be very different conversations. So it's not like easy. It's like, you know, it's hard. And I think it's harder been harder for me to raise 5 million than it was for someone less established or whatever to raise 20 a couple of years ago, because it was really, it was easy. People were throwing all kinds of money around and I'm actually really grateful that I raised a fund last year and have had to answer tough questions and learn things that I wouldn't have been forced to if everybody did just throw five million dollars or 20 at me and say like awesome yay trust fund there's so much more than that it's forced me to you know learn how to do this job and understand things that I wouldn't have were it to have been easier a couple and those people are gonna have a hard time raising another fund and who knows what fun two looks like for me, but I'm going to make noise. And I don't, awesome. yeah, I think you are, you worth like a lot more than $5 million in my eye. And I feel like even just your fans, like, I feel like a lot of people really grow. I would literally watch random people on TikTok and then they're like, you know, I saw them having like, I don't know, 200K followers or like 500K followers. I, for TikTok, I'm like very insensitive about like how many followers people have. And then they're like, oh, my biggest dream is like to do like Sophia Emma Russo's makeup. And then they're like, they already done like Chris Jenner's makeup and basically stuff like this. I feel like you ha- you're like so much more like influential than $5 billion in general for okay. like a fund. And like, I wonder when you are, if you're like starting out today, what would you do to make Trust Bond a success? And like you mentioned, there's a lot of people with less experience, less track record, raising bigger fund. And I wonder what's your, in your observation, what makes a person success, like a successful at like fundraising and managing a fund? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty new here. So I've only observed so many people raising funds. So I'll caveat my answer with that. And in terms of raising five, just to go back to me being worth more than five, it's like I can write friendly checks and get into any deal if it's 200, 250 K okay. I'm leading. So I don't have to duke it out with top tier firms. I'm their buddy and there's room for me. If I had a $50 million fund, I would have to be le- leading or writing a thousand checks or having like 80% reserves with this check size. So it was a strategic move for fund one to be writing the check size that I am. 
and the fund size is limited as a result of that. That it still works at 20 or 30, but I think it'd be a lot harder not to lead it a $200 million fund, which I don't know if I have aspirations for. I mean, the people who like who's doing a good job fundraising right now, like I don't even have an answer, right? So I think who's doing a good job or who has done a good job is very dependent on the macro environment and sentiment around investing in funds and you know where people are or putting their money where allocators are allocating. But I think either it's people with a really strong, deep, like technical expertise that can vet a very specific sector in a way that no one else can and can convince other people of that who ideally already has relationships, right? I can't imagine starting a fund with no relationships and I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. I mean, I started it because I think I'm going to be good at it and I have an advantage. It's not like, wow, I woke up when, you know, I came out of high school and was like, oh, I'm going to do this and start Mm -hmm. zero. I wouldn't have been an employable analyst. So Mm -hmm. it just wouldn't have done that. But, and then also, you know, people talk a lot about operators, but I think, you know, fund managers that have built pretty sizable businesses know what it takes, have done all the shit, have raised, have just been, you know, experienced the highs and the lows, make great GPs. And I think also, you know, second time founders make great founders to invest in. So that's always a bonus. And then there's the the GP who makes noise, right? And that really works. Like creating content, you know, Nicole Wishoff has done a great job. I mean, she's a lot more to offer than creating content. But, you know, when you elevate, everybody's a thought leader in some way or can become one. And when you elevate yourself to that level, even on your own channels, other people tend to follow suit and believe that you're a thought leader. And if, and they can see your personality instead of just your logo on your fun site, they're like, oh, wow, I identify with this person. So I think personality and who it is, like the person who's investing has become increasingly important than the firm. And even the multi-stage firms, you know, their partners are tweeting and doing shit now they didn't used to because it's you know it's table stakes and it's Mm -hmm. their reputation and logo alone aren't something that they should be relying on as they get kind of long in the teeth totally i wonder who are your first i know that like you know obviously like mark Andreessen and chris dixon they all invest in your fun and i wonder like who do you identify as like your ideal lp and how did you win about learning about how to do this? Because obviously you have, this is so much work to learn about starting a fund as well as winning, picking, having deal flow. It's one thing. And then there's also the other set of things, which is managing a small business and then you're managing multiple business at this point. I wonder how do you figure out how to do this thing? And then do you have like a system for yourself? Like, you know, creating an Excel sheet on like, here's like 45 people I met and I need to like learn X, Y, Z. I've reverse engineered almost everything. So if I don't know it, I ask it. If I don't know them, I find them. You know, I, I watched Ryan at product at, at Weekend Fund, Product Hunt, mm-hmm. but Weekend Fund. And then I'm an LP in Shrug in Neve Drawer and Marcia's Fund and saw their investor updates and saw, you know, the way they show performance of their companies, the way they offer SPVs to people and they do these really interesting drops. I'm not doing that. Saw how they built their brand and made noise with merch and, you know, stuff on the Jumbotron and Times Square. But, you know, watched Neve who had, you know, real, he'd spent time at Product Hunt, but wasn't someone who spun out of a, a venture firm, learn along the way and do things differently. I mean, literally, what? here's how. It's been on my desk for like two years. It's a venture capital book. The business of venture capital. Yeah, I, I own the same book. And it's like, yeah, it's like dog-eared and like annotated and like textbook. Every you know, listening to swimming with allocators and the ten x oh, yeah, podcast yeah. and you know the limited partner podcast and venture unlocked and whatever, reading every Sapphire Venture stuff and signing up for Signature Block and I mean, there's so much out there. And then asking people, just asking lots of questions and asking somebody like, what's in your data room? send me a list. Oh, can I see your DDQ? I don't have a due diligence questionnaire for fun two yet, but how in depth does that need to be? Holy shit. I need to like articulate a cybersecurity policy when I go raise fun two. Like this is an institutional, it will be an institutional fund. It's like, what got me here will not get me there. It's not like a cute, like 
Sophia, anybody will give her money. It's like, no, like these people are investing. They're investing other people's money. These aren't just high net worth folks with conviction who can afford to lose a hundred, couple hundred grand. So a lot of it's just like watching what other people are doing, doing my own way. You know, my LP updates are really fun and funny. I sign up for affinity expensive, but I think it's incredible. My relationships are like half of my value. And I have, you know, I've got, this is how, you know, a good part of how I'm going to scale myself is, you know, I've got lists of LPs by name, LPs by organization of sponsors of meetings that I want to book for upfront venture firms and then individual, you know, venture investors that I want to stay on, on top of. I have like all of our opportunities and like, you know, a Kanban board and mark them based on status, like all the time. I have all of my notes in here. I have a whole list of resources for my founders. So it's like, oh, cool. Here's some software. Great. You could use this, or here's some AI marketing thing, or here's a creative agency that if, when you need to hire someone to do your brand, like here's this database, it's all labeled by whatever. Here's some like e-com businesses that are under 50 million in revenue who could be great customers for you. Cause I know a lot of them because I was in consumer. But I don't need to think about it and regurgitate it on text every time someone's trying, you know, one of my companies is asking for intros. I can, you know, filter this and send them a spreadsheet and say, send me a blurb, I'm going to fire this off and ultimately have like a virtual assistant fired off or whatever. Things like that and systems and how you request things from me, whatever, like as I scale, as I work with more founders, that's going to be the way that I'm able to scale myself. I mean, what else do I have open? I have DocSend, AngelList, Tactic, Google Drive. I have Typeform, which connects to Affinity for like the application for founders to submit their pitches. I've got some sheets open. I created a job board for my companies with Airtable and Softer.io. Love it. I sit around and like tweak and build this stuff myself. I mean, the websites, I have the Fund CFO newsletter, Signature Block, the Data Revolution in Venture Capital open. I have the Venture Investors Playbook Part 1 from Flybridge. I've got uh, Carta's website open. This is starting a fun venture playbook, but this sounds a little bit like rookie for me. I'm going to close it. I've got Gusto open because I have an analyst um, on my team who is awesome. And so I've got some payroll, LinkedIn. I mean, it's like I could go on. I have DocuSign open. What else is bookmarked? Todoist. Uh, docsend to pdf with a two.com you can like rip any pdf out of a docsend and keep it it's awesome i use vimcal i just started using this new email thing i'm trying it out called missive i'm a sucker for free trials until until they automatically uh, charge you a credit card <laughs> yeah and then i emailed them and i'm like please 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 please, please. take me off please. <laughs> oh my god i wonder what's your okay so let's say you meet the first round venture partner and let's say you meet Rob and like, how do you maintain the relationship? What's your, like, I guess, like, do you have to do like a certain amount of favor for them or like just being a thought partner? Mm -hmm. And I wonder how do you, I guess, like just maintain the relationship because I feel like everybody is busy. Obviously you are yeah. very important, but on the other hand, like, yeah, I wonder if I'm like asking you, hey, Sophia, tell me 55 things of like how to start a fund or something, you will be like, okay, remove block. But I wonder yeah, how do you be. Too many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Rob, I think well, part of it takes time. Relationships take time. I will be 40 in April. I don't know if I already said that, but you don't look 40 at all. Thanks. I got a Zoom filter. Thanks for doing Zoom and not Riverside because I've got this like little filter and this. Oh, you look great. Thanks. But like, a lot of the people who are helping me have known for a long time. And I met with, an, I, when I was an entrepreneur, you know, Rob, I've, I mentioned the Upfront Summit, but I went there, you know, they invite lots of founders. I went there as a founder for years before I started the fund. And now they have, you know, now I'm going as a fund manager and there's LPs and there's a whole LP day, which is like, okay, now I'm paying for it, but it takes time. It's showing up in the places they already are. Rob isn't super active first round, you know, like he was there for a long time. He made some amazing investments. He's still there, but he still writes checks, but it's going to be probably going to be someone else that, that you're meeting. That's going to be at the thing. And you just keep popping up. You find a way to get in and then you pop up and you're there. Oh, look, there I am again. Oh, interesting. Are you a peer? Why aren't you invited? Maybe you snuck in. There's just, you know, a sense of you 
ubiquity or if that's the word like where they got familiar with you like it's about yeah lot and it takes time saying. every small win is an opportunity to like leverage whether it's like you're on a podcast or you you know have some accolade or something to show even if it's small it's on your linkedin it's validating right you can cold write someone on linkedin or email them you're like hey here's a little bit more about me it was on grace's podcast if you want to no, if you want to know, well, that's okay. Well, Grace anointed me as a, you know, someone that's worth talking to, you know, it could be a much smaller podcast, whatever. Well, that's interesting. And then each of those things is a little wedge or a little bit of leverage to, you know, continue, you know, posting on your LinkedIn, whatever. And it's just like, it's building relevance. And a lot of that has to do with other people opting in and participating in the content you create or talking about you ask for introductions and ask for advice. People love giving advice. I have mentors because I ask for advice, not because they show up and just start mansplaining. You know, people are really flattered when you ask them advice. I love this job because I get to be a mentor and it makes me feel very good about myself that I can help people. It's like a selfish, you know, like asking, it's like a compliment to be asked advice. And I think for you, I bet like thousands of people are lining up to ask you for advice. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot. And a lot of intros, just like this person and this person, this fund, the intros are interesting. And I don't, I'm starting to have like, okay, I'm not taking informational calls. Like, I don't know how to say it, but it's like my schedule's jammed just doing my job. And if think, um, but I am in a, yes, I'm new here. Like there are periods of yes and without burning out. I'm much more in a yes mode than I have been in the last several years because I need to build relationships and I want to meet founders and I am establishing myself not as like the nasty gal or the girl boss or like, oh, this is a hobby. Oh, she has a fun, cute. Oh, it's an angel fund. Is it a rolling fund? Like, what is it? Oh, no, oh, it's a real fund. Oh, oh shit. Maybe she knows something. No. Like I have to, I have to like, I still have, I have to prove myself. I can't just be like the nasty gal who throws a party during LA tech week. You know, there's like, I mean, what's wrong with that? Like, I, because I'm managing right? people's money and I'm committed to, you know, a fund that has to create returns and there's more to it than hype, but I can do that too. I mean, what do you think managing a fund kind of like draws to you? Like what, what make it attractive besides, oh, it's a fund. So managing the fund, I'd say like, if that's the language is not what attracts me. <laughs> to it like that's the job what attracts me to it is that I have an opportunity to learn that I have an opportunity to make an impact that I can create a job for myself I think like I'm need a job like I need to you know not like retired I think you are you already made it so but anyway I like made it but I'm not like like retired rich whatever because you know the advantage that I told you about this like weird stack because I love it because I I'm scrappy still when it comes to like sourcing or winning or having someone else co-sign on something I think could be a, de- a good idea or teach me what might not be right about it. I just love working with founders and I like being in the weeds and I have a lot to give and it energizes me and my learning curve is, I think my learning curve is about as steep as my ability to learn my, my this pace that I can learn right now. I've definitely been in jobs, you know, at Nasty Gal where the learning curve and speed, the velocity of that curve was beyond my ability. And this is very challenging and I still have a lot to learn, but I feel like what I don't know I can learn and what I don't need to learn, I can rent from people who have educations or experience and something complementary to my skill set, which can't be learned. (laughs) <laughs> what do you think is like the most challenging thing for you burnout I think just like managing my time because I'll just like sit in air table and make a job board that none of my founders asked for and just, yeah no I'm just like look here's some resources look here's I'm just like they're not asking for most of the stuff I'm you know a lot of the stuff I'm providing for them but I'm like they don't know that I know this person and can make an intro oh holy shit mm-hmm. that could be a game changer so it's like generating if there's no end to the value I would to provide and there's no end to the amount of learning I could take on yeah I don't know so I think it's like getting enough sleep right now it's because this is it is very much a I, I need to send you like a mushroom hot chocolate or something so you can go no, to mushrooms don't agree with me I'm like I just like I like high noon and mess out. It's like oh this, god 
biggest great like canned hard spritz seltzer i don't know but it's good they have a black cherry flavor that's hella good and they should send me some for free oh if they're listening to this podcast no they're not they're like they're like a really exploding business but i'm not a psychedelic weed party drug i have tattoos and i think people think that like i'm edgy like no i just like drinking once in a while Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends to listen too or enemies, I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.